Hello YouTube, thanks for tuning in. I hope life is treating you well. In this video, I try to answer the question, how do I get into overlanding? And more specifically, how do I get my unibody all-wheel drive vehicle ready for outdoor adventures? I'll need to get this out of the way right at the start. A four-wheel drive body-on-frame vehicle will upgrade differently than a unibody all-wheel drive vehicle. I'm going to be recommending skid plates as one of the first things you need for an all-wheel drive. That won't apply to your four-wheel drive. Also, I expect a lot of people to be chiming in in the comment section. There will be a lot you can learn from reading other people's comments, so I encourage that you do. So what is overlanding? According to the Overland Journal, overlanding is self-reliant adventure travel to remote destinations where the journey is the primary goal. Overlanding is about exploration rather than conquering obstacles. In my own words, it's vehicular adventure travel. I call it car-based backpacking. You get outdoors, and instead of a backpack to rely on, you are relying on your vehicle to carry your gear, your food, and you need a self-sustain. Overlanding is an activity. It's not a competition, it's not a sport. Literally, the definition of off-roading is the sport, well, also activity, of conquering obstacles. That's not what you're doing here. To me, overlanding has a different mindset than off-roading. To me, it's not about getting to that end destination. It's about the journey and getting you, your companions, and your vehicle through in one piece. best piece of advice is to go with people who have been overlanding for a little bit. Just because when you go on a trail by yourself and you're on your own and you see an obstacle, you don't, you, you haven't off-roaded much, you know, it's, it's kind of scary to be honest. But as soon as you see another car go over an obstacle, you're like, oh, I could do that. Don't go alone. Bring extra food and water and make sure that you're somewhere where you can either get on CB or have uh, cell service. Don't go venturing farther than your capabilities. Just like with what everyone else said is to go with friends. AJ had a really good point. He said, go with friends that have lots of experience that can show you the right lines to take on the trails. And I totally agree with that. Um, it's also good to just to have someone to give you advice. Good to have someone that could be your mentor. It's not wrong to be over prepared, but don't feel that you need to buy a $65,000 vehicle and throw on $30,000 in upgrades. You don't need to do that. It's best to just start with the vehicle you have now. Um, and that's not just me saying that. There's a lot of other um, prominent overlanding channels. Um, I, I'm, not an, I'm not a prominent overlanding channel. You'll hear that from Trail Recon. River Overland and some other other YouTubers. They say start with what you have and figure out your vehicle's capabilities. Find out if you if you're going to need more. You might not like overlanding. Why dump dump a bunch of money into a hobby that you might not even like? So it's really important to go with people, um, go with a group or go with a friend. Because the other helpful thing about that is. You don't need to buy every single piece of equipment for your vehicle, especially recovery gear. You know, max tracks, uh, tow rope, snatch straps, all that stuff adds up. And a, and a winch. And a winch, yeah. All that stuff adds up. But if you're with a group of people, most overlanders are happy to assist you if you get stuck, if you need a piece of equipment, you know, and, and that's, that's very helpful is to go with a group of people, or go with a couple people or one person that that knows what they're doing and that has the proper equipment. Um, Excellent piece of advice. Yeah. If you're a Subaru person, it's always wise to bring a front CV axle. Uh, most of them are equal length, uh, so most of the time they can swap back and forth, but uh, most of the time Subarus break down on their CV axles. Um, so having an extra one and having the stuff to be able to change on the trail is a good good thing to do. Uh, go Always go with people. So. I was there to be a mentor. I was there to kind of, you know, as a referee, just kind of cut in like, nope, 
No way, don't. Um, so it's so important that you go with others. Um, once you develop your skill and uh, maybe build out your rig a little more, add a winch, then you could probably go on your solo trips. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but I'm just saying to safely go on your trips. Um, it would be good to have experience and um, other types of recovery gear to uh, safely go on solo adventures. Okay, first upgrades. And we're talking about the all-wheel drive vehicles. So, all right, number one, I am gonna say skid plates. And the reason I say that is if you're new to all this stuff and you're using too much momentum, you haven't quite learned how to choose the proper line and you smash your oil pan on a rock, that is game over. That is gonna be so incredibly hard to repair compared to a flat tire. I think both will go hand in hand, but if you had to choose between the two with an all-wheel drive unibody, I would say skip plates, hands down. Um, the next definitely would be tires. Not only will these tougher all-terrain or mud terrain or even rough terrain tires will give you more traction, but they'll be more impervious to uh, flat. They'll be tougher, right? Tougher sidewalls, tougher shoulders. So I think the two really go hand in hand, skid plates and tires. Uh, could you explain why on a CUV, a crossover vehicle, skid plates are the most important piece? Because I don't think you actually went right. over that. With a all-wheel drive unibody, you'll typically have a lot of the vitals, vital parts hanging low. Compare that to a truck-based system where it's body on frame, you will have the body on top and then the ladder frame on bottom. So all, all the vitals are gonna be up here and then you got your, got your frame down here. As with a unibody, you pretty much eliminate this part and you got the vitals just like right there. So that's why having that underbody protection to me would be, definitely be the first upgrade. A less clearance and uh, like with this Honda, a lot of the vitals sit up high, but um, there's still enough parts that sit down low. Yeah, it was good you explain that because not everybody will might know right. like, well, why skid plates, you know? Right. Um, okay. Because that for sure is not a first mod on bigger four by fours. Right. And you know, right. And truck bodies. Okay. Another thing about all-wheel drive vehicles and how you should prepare them. Okay, so we, we could probably start talking about a lift kit. So after you get your skid plates and your tires, uh, a lift kit to give you more ground clearance, more more uh, room for error will be a good upgrade. Okay, now how does one prepare their vehicle for overlanding? Well, well what would be the first upgrades? What's the, what's the priority? What is the uh, progression that priority someone should upgrades. have? Yeah, so if you look at this rig, for a first time overlander, it could be intimidating. And hopefully you look at something like this as an inspiration and not an intimidation. You know, this shouldn't be like some sort of gatekeeper, like, oh, I need to do, have all that to go overlanding. No, you don't. I would say the most important thing, I mean, I have a rooftop tent, an awning, a winch, a front bumper, none of that matters. You just need good tires. So nice set of all-terrain tires, and most importantly, probably the most important piece of equipment is a full-size spare tire. Um, you don't have to get a fancy swing out or a fancy rear bumper to carry one, but just know that if you do have a full-size, most likely it doesn't fit in your stock location, so it's gonna take up some space in your trunk. But it's better to have a full-size spare that takes up space than to not have one when you really need it most. Um, Tires are really the number one most important. And then from there, um, lifting your vehicle allows you to fit bigger tires and allows you to clear obstacles easier. Um, but that that's the other thing too that, I don't recommend someone just getting a rig or getting a Subaru, getting whatever, and then just immediately lifting it. Because you're missing out on the difference, you know, how much that lift really helps you. You should probably go off-roading in your stock vehicle at stock height, go through some obstacles, and really see what your clearance is. <laughs> then when you get that lift, even if it's just one inch, two inches, you're gonna be like, wow, what a huge difference. Um, 
I think that, you know, yeah. I see people jumping to all these mods immediately, and, you know, you can do that, and it's great. It'll make your car ride better, but it's hard to appreciate it when you don't know how your vehicle was before you did all the modifications. Um, you know, we were off, we've been off-roading for years, you know, 10 years I've had forerunners mostly, um, first gen, second gens, third gens, and for a long time I didn't have to lift them, you know, I just put some decent set of tires and, um, yeah, that's all you really need as far as the vehicle itself and, you know, of course all the proper maintenance and all that, you know, we can, we can go down a rabbit hole with pro proper maintenance, but it's really different for every vehicle. Um, some vehicles have weaker parts than others, so Toyota Tacomas and uh, second gen Tacomas, sorry, no, first gen Tacomas and third gen Forerunners, notorious for ball joint failures. And they'll just fail out of nowhere. You know, I, I've had it happen to me. I was stuck in the snow on a trail overnight, unprepared, didn't have a sleeping bag, didn't have anything. And I was freezing that night, but I had to stay to wait for part to come up so I could fix the ball joint in the snow the next morning. When you go on your first overlying adventure, you need to be prepared with um, with food and water, right? Even when you, if you're gonna do a day trip, because just knowing that your vehicle might break down on the trail, you should be bringing food and water, extra food and water, an abundant amount, especially if you're new and you don't know what you're doing and you might break your vehicle. And especially if you're going alone. Actually, I still don't recommend going alone. Back in April of 2021, so not, not too long ago, right? Uh, five months ago. They're from Arizona and they brought their, their Subaru, completely stock, stock tires. They brought it to Death Valley and they brought plenty of food and water. Um, the guy was a, uh, he was part of the military and he was trained in survival, okay? They were missing for about three days, and unfortunately, uh, the guy perished. The, the, the lady survived and all that, but basically what happened was they had the supplies, they had the water, but they were alone, and they ran out of food and water over a three-day period. And this was in April, so it wasn't incredibly hot, but it was hot enough. That's why I say, number one, go with other people or have the means to communicate, so satellite communicator, the Garmin InReach or something like that, to have like an SOS button. That would be a good thing to have, or just for your first adventure, go somewhere where you never lose cell reception, right? I think you, you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, and another thing too, is kind of like that rule when you go hiking or backpacking or mountain biking, you always tell one person where you're going. There you go. That way if you, right. cause if you could be missing for a week and no one will know you're missing. You know, yeah. but if you tell someone, hey, I, I'm supposed to be back on Wednesday and you're not back on Thursday, you're going to start to right. worry. They're going to start to look for you. And so that couple from Arizona, they did that. They told people where they're going and they should, you know, they should be checking in on this date. That's how, that's how people knew to look for them. Yeah. And they're, they're lost for about three days and, and eventually uh, they did a air search. Uh, they did a helicopter uh, search and they found the vehicle. Unfortunately, they left the vehicle. That's a rule, you shouldn't leave your vehicle, right? Because vehicles are found, in almost all instances, vehicles are found before they find people. So, all right, I think that's uh, pretty much it. Is there anything else you can think of? So that does it for this episode. I hope you found this video useful. And I know there's gonna be a lot of people with advice to first time overlanders. So please comment below. I. I want to hear, I think everyone wants to hear what you think is going to be the best first upgrades or best uh, practices for someone getting into overlanding. The advice in this video presented a good formula to successfully go on your first time overlanding trip. Go with friends and give your vehicle protection both skid plates and tires. A lift kit, not so, not so necessary for your first trip out. There are a lot more things that go into it. It's good to have lots of recovery gear. I actually made a website two years ago. It's an informational website. There's no ads. I made it specifically 
to answer questions people had on YouTube. When someone asked something, I would just refer them to this website. I do it all the time with my social media accounts. People message me on Instagram, I send them to the website. It makes my life easier. And as you can see here, there's a lot of things that you might consider getting. And that list probably isn't even complete. I don't think I even included a winch on this list. That would be a nice thing to have, especially if you're a solo adventurer. Okay, so that does it. I hope you enjoyed everything. And um, anyways, I hope you all take care. And also, I hope you have fun on your adventures.